This is, I, I have had an awakening, and I think the libertarian effort and platform is what I believe. I've been endorsed by the libertarian uh, candidate group, which I think is great. Gary Johnson is not, but Gary Johnson has endorsed me. And I have a quote that he, he made, which is kind of nice. And um, I'm pushing him to s submit an application to you, Gigi, because I think it's important that we be liberty candidates. And uh, I'm a libertarian, no matter who you vote for, or whether it's Anthony or me in the third district, I'm, I'm still a libertarian, and I'm going to uh, push for that. And uh, I, again, thank everybody for, for coming. Hello, my name is Anthony Tolba. Uh, this is my second run for the United States Congress. I completed my first run in 2010 with the Constitution Party. And we made history in the party by just making the ballot. And I actually won the News 12 debates. And I, I can say that with every bit of confidence, because I actually met one of Steve Israel's staffers the February after the 2010 election. And he said to me that it became the joke in the Steve Israel campaign office that I only got into the News 12 debate at his will because he thought that I would split votes away from the Republicans. And nobody, they told me that nobody in the Israel camp expected me to perform well, and then I turned around and I beat him. <laughs> so I think I have a strong case to make for myself as, as being the candidate that has taken the fight to Steve Israel the hardest in regards to intellectual property and beating him in a debate. I'm a pyrotechnician and a financial consultant. I've seen the, uh, the disaster on Wall Street from a front row seat to this seemingly never-ending horror movie. And uh, I am a very hands-on candidate. I've attended a lot of tea parties. I've attended Occupy Wall Street and written articles on my experiences with both. I actually uh, wrote an article about some women at Occupy Wall Street that were having uh, some of their constitutional rights violated while they were in jail, which I think is just absolutely abhorrent, and, and there's no excuse for that. Um, that can be found on my Facebook page. Uh, I should also mention I made a, a pretty big splash in the beginning of my 2010 campaign making worldwide news yelling at Steve Israel at the town hall meeting on health care. Uh, it's, it's actually my Facebook profile pic, a, a supporter of mine in the Midwest put lettering on it that says, the shout heard around the world, an American revival. I'm very proud to carry that title. I'm endorsed by Dr. Renee Toko. Her and her mother travel all over the country uh, advocating for parents' rights in regards to vaccinating their children and promoting uh, for autism in regards to bio-nutrition and, uh, and their chiropractic treatments. I'm also endorsed by Glenn Main of Oath Keepers, which I think is a very important endorsement, especially in this race when the Republican candidate um, happens to be a veteran. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean he is best suited to defend our Constitution and restore our Constitution. I would make the case that, uh, that I'm the best choice to do that. And uh, clearly, the New York State chapter leader of Oath Keepers agrees. OK. We're going to open it up to the floor like last time for questions. So uh, since Michael went first, you'll answer the first question. Yes, Chris. Uh, Anthony, uh, did you have your case go on getting on the ballot as a Republican? Well, um, there's a silver lining to this cloud. I, I represented myself pro se in New York State Supreme Court in Nassau. Uh, Justice Morano found in my favor, which uh, was very encouraging and is very, very rare for a candidate to represent themselves pro se in an election case and actually win. Um, so what happened was we were appealed on a technicality, which is not an absolute. We were thrown out in the appeals court on the technicality. They did not rule on the merits of the case because uh, for obvious reasons, if you read the transcript, which I will make available, and then we went, we moved to appeal that decision, and that court gave us a one-line uh, one response, no, we're not going to listen to your case. We're going to take more questions for the candidates themselves. Yes, Mark? Um, are either of you seeking the uh, endorsement of any other parties? One minute, Michael. Uh, no, I, I did. I uh, prepared the designated petition as Republican, and I decided that um, the Republican Party has lost me. I've seen very little difference between the Republican Party and the Democrat Party. It's all a blurry line. The fact is they vote, one votes one way, one votes the other way. They're, they're for the income tax, they're for taxing us half to death. Or ta they're, I mean, it's, it's become the point. So I decided, why would I want to be a Republican? Because being a Republican is not what I believe in. In fact, I, I, want to, I want to make an announcement today that after 40 years of being a Republican, 
Last week, I went down to the Board of Elections, and I changed my party affiliation. I am now officially a, lib a libertarian. And I want to say that. Because you guys have the right idea. And I don't know where I've been. I don't know where, what hole my head has been stuck in. I don't want to even guess which one. But <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you that the libertarian right. way of going is the way to go. If we don't do that, we're, we're screwed. Let's, let's hear the part uh, about Anthony's answer on that now. Uh, I am the Constitution Party nominee again for 2012, I'm very proud to say, and uh, I know not everybody here is in complete love with the Constitution Party, but I would make the case that there are very many principles that, uh, that are aligned, uh, one of them being abolishing the IRS. Uh, now also, keep in mind, each Constitution Party state chapter uh, is not beholden to each other state chapter. Uh, much like our republic, and the New York State Constitution Party leadership has changed for this election cycle, and theoretically uh, will, will stay the same for a while. I, I certainly hope so, because the new leadership is a lot more libertarian-minded, and I, I would really uh, love the opportunity to be able to work with both of these parties, uh, not just in an effort to make a point in this election, I've already done that in the last election, in an effort to win this election, um, and, and have a representative in Congress to, to represent both uh, their parties. Chris, well, for both candidates, this is going to make it uh, twice as hard for you to get on the ballot because you're going to need a minimum of 7,000 signatures. And uh, Mr. McDermott, uh, what, uh, what do you plan to do to, to get those, uh, those 3,500 signatures you need? Okay, Anthony can go for that. Well, in my case, I've been building a reputation for myself um, that was not only nationwide, but I, I do have some supporters uh, out of the country as well. Clearly, they won't be helping this petitioning process, only voters in the state, but I, I've been building this foundation and this name base <coughs> since October 2009. So I do have a, a large amount of volunteers that are willing to assist me with these signatures. And aside from that, uh, when I was collection, collecting signatures from the Republican Party, I got over 900 Republican signatures by myself. Now, if you do the math there, uh, it's, it's almost three times as harder to get those Republican signatures. So times that by about 3.2, because Republicans are smaller in, in the territories uh, in the congressional district on Long Island than even the independents. So theoretically, I, I got close to 3,000 just on my own. OK, Michael, one minute. Uh, Gary Johnson, a uh, campaign had approached me and asked me to be the New York chairman of the party, of his campaign. And I, uh, I told him no, because I really want to concentrate on the congressional campaign that I'm running. And um, they, uh, but they did ask me if I would be the co-chair for Long Island, which is the first, second, third, fourth, you know, the districts. Uh, so I, as soon as they, I decided that I would help them, I, I called a meeting of the Gary Johnson campaign. So uh, the Queens Libertarian Party has already endorsed me. So uh, if you guys endorse me and, and the Nassau County endorse me, then my name will go on the Gary Johnson petition. And I'll be collecting signatures. And I've already promised everybody I'll move the 5,000 signatures. I've got now 42 people that are friends of mine that have promised to help. So I figure I'll get probably about 20. Uh, but I'm working on that right now. And that's not including the Gary Johnson campaign. There are people there that are going to help. So I will deliver 5,000 signatures. I, I promise you. I will do that. And, I don't, and I'm going to do it as soon as I can. Okay. From July 10th. That's yeah, it. Don't start till then. Four questions. <laughs> no, don't start till then. In the audience. Questions, particularly on issues, would be nice. So we can see a difference between the candidates. Okay, do the candidates have questions for each other? Wait, wait, wait. They have a question. Okay. Great. Do you want to be in the community organization? Okay, a minute for you. Okay. Start uh, college. Well, I was elected to the Hop House School Board uh, in 1986. Uh, I was the president in my second and third year. Now, when Ed Romain guided me and, and asked me, you know, well, what do I do? I said, he said, that was the kiss of death. But I can tell you that every year that I was the president of the school board, we reduced taxes. I went through two teacher negotiations. I was the, pres I was the, uh, uh, I was the president of the school board for two years. I was my, my kid's soccer coach. I was involved with the Brownies. I was my kid's class mother. You know, we were younger. I now have a seven-year-old. Um, I was instrumental in pushing through a no-labels approach, which I'll, I'll tell you after I have a minute, because it's going to take more than a minute to talk. Um, so I've been very involved in the community. Um, I haven't attended local uh, town board meetings of late. I used to do that. In fact, uh, Steve Levy asked me if I would run 
uh, for office when he was a Democrat? And I said, no. <laughs> and then, of course, he turned into a Republican. But that was many years ago. And, uh, but I have been involved in everything. I'm going to attend the Queens Libertarian Party meetings. I'm going to attend the Nassau County Libertarian Party meetings, as well as the Suffolk okay. meetings. And the New York Foundation for that. Yes. Um, well, it, it's my mainstay of, of community organizations. It's actually quite interesting how it came about. When I was gathering signatures in the summer of 2010 for the Constitution Party, a lot of people in uh, the town where I currently reside, Huntington, had told me there's a, a local school where a child was injured, uh, shot in a drive-by shooting, and uh, what would I suggest, how would I suggest fixing a problem like that? And it's, it's a very interesting question, it's certainly not one I was expecting. And uh, what I said was, as with uh, most questions of how do we solve problems in America, the answers lie with the people, as much as the politicians do not like to allow for those answers to materialize. And I said, well, if we had had our Second Amendment rights, the situation likely never would have deteriorated to a point where a child's being uh, shot in front of a school <coughs> in Huntington. Uh, and, I, and I made the case, well, if we could restore our Second Amendment rights, uh, that would be a good thing. So I ended up with the Guardian Angels. Uh, if anybody's not familiar, Curtis Lee was started them in the Bronx 33 years ago. And what they do is volunteer uh, safety patrols in communities that need the help. They have no weapons, they do carry handcuffs, and they practice martial arts. Okay. Uh, you know, I'm a little confused with the previous answer. Uh, you asked for an endorsement. You said you got one from Queens, you want one from here. Is that concerning being the co chair for the Gary Johnson campaign? No, no, no. 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 That is Congress, but every county does it separately. And, and so, is that sort of like a, a, a listen uh, here? Uh, is that like a bribe to everybody here that you get oh, 5,000? Signatures right. for Gary Johnson if uh, they endorse you now rather than. Sure, you can call uh, it that. You can call it that. Let's get let's get to some other questions. On that. Actually, I have some. Money. I, how much would it take to get you? <laughs> I don't, I'm not bribing anybody. Bruce, you have a question. I have a, a question for both candidates. In either order, uh, your opponent is Steve Israel. Yes. Name one or two, if you must, uh, from his red voting record that you're going to attack. Can I have extra time. <laughs> One, two, or three? Uh, well, you have HR 347, you have CISPA, you have NDAA. Yes, um, Okay, well, I, I do go into detail in an article I wrote on my Facebook page, but uh, the HR 347 is also known as the anti-Occupy Wall Street bill. What it does is, if there's a Secret Service presence within 500 yards, 500 yards of any protest, every single protester at that arrest, no matter how peaceful, is subject to arrest. And now, felony. Now, felony. Now, keep in mind, Secret Service is not only the president, it could be when Michelle Obama takes a famous ice cream cone trip while she tells everybody not to eat ice cream cones. Uh, it could be a Bilderberg meeting, it could be a UN meeting, and uh, it could also be something where, okay, we have a problem with the Occupy people, or we have a problem with the Tea Party people, send Michelle Obama to go get an ice cream cone 500 yards away, 499 yards away, and just arrest everybody. Okay, a minute, Michael. The loss of liberties is the biggest thing that I can, I can talk about. And we've lost, we just lost so much. Steve Israel voted with Nancy Pelosi, I think, 99% of the time. And they both did not get anything done. My biggest problem with Steve Israel is nothing gets done. You know that they've submitted uh, over 3,000 bills in Congress uh, in the 112th Congress, and less than 300 have even gone to the committee here. And, and that's a big problem, because we're not getting anything done. Well, yeah, the bad ones get through. <laughs> yeah, the bad, just bad ones. Well, not many of them either. I mean, well, only the bad ones. Yeah. I don't know of any good one that has gotten through. Uh, Steve Israel, just, he, he's been there for, this is the, he'll be 14 years in Congress, voting this way. But he's got a war chest of one and a half million dollars before he even came in. You know, I don't have a, a million and a half dollars. I have to do it on a grassroots level. And in response to this lady's question about the bribe, it's not a bribe, it's that I was a Barry Johnson campaign. We're working together. They asked me, I didn't approach that. Constitution Party approached me. I, I mean, also, I am a member of I was people. told you approached them. Well, that's not true. Okay, good. <laughs> um, we'll give, this is a little interesting, so we'll give 30 seconds of rebuttal and then you 30 seconds to 30 seconds. I was told by the Constitution Party leadership of this state, who I'm in direct communication with, and I had the nomination of before any communication was had with you, that you reached out to them. 
There was confusion due to the district lines being redrawn and the incumbents swapping a number. They were confused. They said they would get back to you. When they discovered the situation, they told you they had committed to me and were remaining with me. Aside from that, Steve Israel has got something done. His brainchild, Cash for Clunkers, made our, our exports of scrap metal go sky high, which somebody mentioned earlier today. Michael, 30 seconds. You, say, you keep saying they in technicalities. Um, who's they? In regards to what? The Constitutional the Party. Gary right? Gunsher, for one. Um, Chris O'Hare, for another. And that's the chair and vice chair of the Constitution Party, currently. Okay. Well, Chris O'Hare had approached me. He is the vice chair. And he approached me, he's a friend of, of a friend of mine, and he told me that they're really not happy with the results of the last election. Where I know you won you won the debate, and I hope you win this debate, because 106,000 votes against 1,200 is pretty good when you don't win the debate. But I can tell you that Chris O'Hare approached me. In fact, he called me today. He wanted he was planning on staying over at my house tonight to, to come here. Not, not not to support me, because when they spoke, they he they Gary Gunter told me he was going to support me because I was in the third and he was in the second. I said, wait, Gary. You're not really sure because they redrew the lines. Okay. So before you embarrass yourself, you may want to check. You know, I can put anybody that would like in direct contact with oh, Gary. Ed has a question. Well, it's important that there's, right. there's something being said. Let's say true. either of you won the seat in Congress, don't care which, and in some hell frozen over reality, the Congress said you get to pass one law. <laughs> no, no problem passing it. What would that law be, and why would you want that law? Okay, well, one minute. No. Either one of you go. I don't care. Okay, we're just ending things. I, I would want to pass some kind of a, a nullification act. Mm -hmm. um, the reason being is there are so many laws that ought to be nullified by the states. Um, unfortunately, states are not nullifying laws with the frequency I would like, or any of us I would imagine would like to see them nullifying laws with. And if we could pass a bill that would make it easier to nullify unconstitutional legislation um, through using that bill, then that could not only repeal a system repealing a lot of pre-existing legislation that takes away our rights and is counterproductive to the economy, very many other issues, but it would help us defend against future bills that would attack us. Uh, I really, how do you pick one law? I mean, most laws we have now that are federal government are wrong. You've got to bring the federal government back into its, its constitutionally uh, mandated size. The, 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 uh, the suspension of liberties, the NDAA Act that was signed by Obama in December of last year, the, uh, the repeal of the 16th Amendment for the income tax. I agree with that. One, in 1913, we became slaves, truly. And I didn't realize that until recently. But that has to be repealed. Anything that's non constitutional has to be repealed. And if you're going to vote for something, the first question we should all ask ourselves in Congress is is it constitutional? And if it's not, you say no. Is that so difficult? So, anyway, I, I couldn't pick one thing. Anthony's answer was good. I would go along with that, too. I, uh, we, we've got so much work to do. And not only do we have work to do, we have to do it. We have to be there. We have to show up on time. We have to do the work. And we have to get going and working on a grassroots level. OK. Other questions? I see one from Rick Witt. When you go in there, as I do after we win, we're going to be inheriting mess. <laughs> out of curiosity, since a lot of our problems are having to do with pensions, are you planning on opting out of the congressional pension plan like I am, if you win? One minute. I <laughs> There's a lot of things that congressmen uh, have that the regular people don't have. Health care, pension plan, retirement after three years. Just the salary. I mean, they're the only people I know that can get paid so much money and not get any work done. Seriously. It's and better if they don't. I mean, <laughs> so, yeah. I, uh, the pension, you will yes, out I will opt out. Okay. And one minute. Uh, I don't think I need a minute to say I, I would opt out of the pension. I'm not uh, interested in entitlement programs, and that's, that's not a libertarian principle. Okay. There are other questions. Yes, sir. Yeah, this is for both of them. I'd like to start with the older gentleman. Okay. Uh, and it's a follow-up to that question. Um, this, this salary, this exorbitant salary that you mentioned, uh, would, that, would you be capable of living... Um, Entirely on that salary, or would you have to indeed work still in your former lives? Or and would you like both answer that question, please? Okay. 
Would that be your full time salary and that's all you would do Listen, or would you continue to work? When the founders started all this with the Constitution, you were supposed to go to Congress, do your job, and go home and go back to work. And I have to work for a living. I'm not going to rely on my income as Congress, as good as it might be, to live. I mean, I could live on it. I could live on a lot less than that. In fact, I have for a number of years now. And uh, no, I, I, I want to do my job and I want to go home. And that's, that's the bottom line. Okay. Okay. Sure. Well, uh, in addition to being a congressman, I would be also a pyrotechnician still, um, and I do enjoy the work, um, and it does uh, help me uh, uh, employ um, and help people gain revenue themselves. And I look at it as a very patriotic job. I, I love it, so I would not leave uh, my pyrotechnician job as a financial consultant. I would feel it would be too much of a conflict of interest. I would remove myself from that industry. And I have every intention to continue volunteering with the Guardian Angels when I'm home. Okay. Other questions from the audience? Yes, Mr. Um, there are some laws about possessing stuff and selling stuff to people. Um, uh, I want to know whether or not you would support uh, legalization, say, of heroin. Okay. Well, I would probably present it more as a decriminalization. And I, I think that decriminalization across the board is a good thing. I'm also of the opinion that it, it's more so a state's right issue. Um, I would like to see it done on state's levels um, because we are a republic. So people get to choose certain things for themselves. And I, I believe, uh, and states get to choose certain things for themselves. And I believe it's a state issue. It should be left up to the states. But I, I will seek to decriminalize um, with respect to that in some regards on the, on the federal level. And, and at, the very, at the very core of what I think should be done is the federal government should just butt out of the issue. Okay, one minute, Michael. <coughs> um, I wrestled with the question of drugs because I, I don't do drugs. And uh, I didn't really, I don't know many people that do. Um, but what we do in our own homes is the issue. You should be able to do whatever you want to do in your own home as long as you're not affecting the lives and the rights of somebody else. And I think that's a sacrosanct rule that we should all follow. Now, if you want to do heroin in, in your house, as long as you're not affecting somebody else, what would I care? How would I know? The federal government should certainly not be involved. I mean, the federal government has got to get out of our lives. They're in our lives. And every, now we've got, well, not even the federal government. Mayor Bloomberg wants us to uh, limit our 40 ounce sodas. <laughs> I mean, and they're going to, and see the card, I said a cartoon out that I, somebody had sent to me about drones flying around. Watching out for people with forty ounce cokes. <laughs> it's kind of funny, but you know, it's almost we're almost at that point. You know, I was almost going to come here with forty ounce cokes. I was going to come here with forty ounce cokes. Okay, uh, you already asked. You asked Mark. Um, I find the concept of decriminalizing drugs to be not going far enough because that would imply that you're willing to regulate drugs? Are you willing to regulate drugs as opposed to decriminalizing them? Or are you willing to just have the governments get out, both okay. state and local, get out? What can it like? I'm in favor of criminalizing and deregulating drugs in my house, but only in my house. I don't want it in my house. I have a seven-year-old daughter. She's not doing heroin. But I have control. I should have control of my own house. I don't. My daughter is there. We, we decriminalized. We had we had random urine testing. <laughs> she passed. Years later, she said to me, "I don't know how I passed." <laughs> Sorry, Allison. She'll kill me later. But we've got to get out of our lives. Decriminalizing is a cop out. You know, if you want to smoke a joint, okay, go to your home, do it. Don't don't do something that's going to infringe somebody else's rights. Now the argument comes in, well, what if your kids are home? I mean, there's this issues. And there's going to be a transitional stage to get to that point. But it has to not be decriminalized, because I think that's a compound. It has to be, you have to legalize. You shouldn't even legalize it. It's, it's, I think, your right to be a free person. It's not even okay. a right. That's a minute. I mean, a legal That's a minute. I don't see anything in the enumerated powers in the Constitution that says that Congress should be either regulating, criminalizing, or decriminalizing drugs. Therefore, the powers lie with the states and the people. I am a independent constitution above all, uh, constitutionalist above all. If you want to talk about no labels, no labels means 
precisely that. I don't want to be labeled purely, oh, you're a Constitution Party candidate, this is what you believe. You're a libertarian, this is automatically what you believe. I believe in the Constitution, I believe in sovereignty of states, and, and I believe in the enumerated powers of the Constitution. If you reference that, it would, it would show that it is not within those enumerated powers for Congress to be involved at all. So it's not a cop-out, it's a constitutional answer. It is a state's issue, and it is up to the will of the people in those states. And I would, I would hope that they would choose freedom on their own. Mr. Reed. Um, I wish this question had come up in our informed minds debate, but it never actually came up. So I'd like to ask you guys, what is your opinion on food freedom, like raw milk and um, uh, free-range chicken that uh, the FDA and the Department of Agriculture okay. is um, One minute going down. It's preposterous that they're trying to regulate, regulate what we can eat, what medications we can take, forcing us to take regulations, whether we can eat chickens that are what is it, grade A or grade It's preposterous. Now, for me, I mean, I, I, I'm used to the milk that I get from, from Walmart. So I'll continue to drink that. But I, should you be arrested for drinking raw milk from your own cows? I mean, come on. It's just, it's just preposterous. So no, I'm, I'm absolutely not in favor of the federal government imposing any kind of control. State government has, the states have sovereign, sovereignty over, the, over, their, over their states. And we've gotten way away from that. It's really, it's something that has to change. Okay, one minute. Oh, our Constitution uh, was intended to give us the smallest amount of government as possible, which is certainly a libertarian principle, but also just <coughs> enough government was the intent, only enough to protect individual rights. And I, I believe that in protecting those individual rights, that people ought to be able to make their own food choices. And uh, the Founding Fathers agreed. I did. I don't want to misquote which founding father, but I recall specifically one of them said, if you ever give the government control of the food industry, um, it, will, it will be a, a serious crushing blow to freedom and liberty to those people. And uh, if you look at what a former uh, attorney general, uh, surgeon general rather said, that 90% of illnesses in America come from poor nutrition. If you get the government telling you what proper nutrition is, that's not their role. It's, it's your role to decide what good nutrition is for you. So they're, they're getting involved in your health care okay. again. This one year. Year. Well, I have a right to be up. I see your congressman. A couple years from now, you know, President Obama, Romney, Gary Johnson says, Mike, something's happened across the ocean, whatever, and I need to take your grandson, put a uniform on him, stick a gun in his hand, and kill people in a country he may have never heard of 24 hours ago his for security. <laughs> oh, we don't care what, what his brother says. <laughs> what do you say about that? Well, let's, let's ask that one to Andy. Of both of them, but yeah, yeah. the same thing, you but you've actually have okay, skin in the game in such a situation. One minute, Mr. McDermott. Well, we shouldn't be involved in these wars. I mean, we've been involved in so many things by executive order, it's absolutely beyond my ability to contain myself. When, it, when Obama, or the president, has an executive order to go in the Libyan conflict or any of these other things, he's got to go to Congress. And if you go to Congress and you declare war, then the job of, of our government, mm -hmm. with authorization from Congress, is to go in and win the war, and only when we're threatened. But if, they, if Congress decides that we're threatened, and that's the big question of whether I would vote yes or no, because my, my instinct, my natural instinct would be to vote no, but it's going to depend on the situation. But we go in there, we win the war, and we come home. We don't stay there and build their bridges, hospitals, and all this, and have the bridges falling apart. I mean, that's true. What Mark and Reprise would do is say, listen, we're not at war, but if there's a criminal in a foreign country that has committed a crime against America, then we would take steps to bring that criminal to justice, not occupy, not destroy civilian <coughs> property and civilians and other property. Just bring criminals to justice, and that's it. And I, I also have a, a long track record of saying bring the troops home. Uh, so ever since my, my first public statement of that was on Fox Business, uh, Fox Happy Hour with Rebecca Diamond, just after uh, my, my picture of yelling at Steve Israel went viral on the internet. So uh, not only do I, I want to bring the vast majority of the troops home, I have a track record of doing so, and I will remain consistent 
and doing everything I can to make sure nobody is sent into harm's way without very, very good and constitutionally valid cause. Yes, Jean. I have a question. If, if either one of you does win our nomination, you'll be um, debating Labay and Israel. And both of those gentlemen believe that we should support Israel, not the man, but the <laughs> monetarily and militarily. Um, a lot of people will vote for those people because of that. Where do you guys both stand on that? Well, uh, again, I get back to the constitutional answer. Nowhere is it written within the enumerated powers of the Constitution that we are to fund Israel. And a lot of people in Israel don't want us funding them either because they know that it comes with strings attached. And, and a lot of uh, people that reside in, in Israel look at it as a form of welfare. They don't want to be on welfare. They don't want us meddling in their affairs. And you know, getting back to, uh, to Ron Paul, is one of the very many things I agree with Ron Paul on is he says that if we just stop uh, doling out money all over the world, Israel would benefit vicariously through that because we're funding their enemies ten times to the tune that we're funding Israel. So it, it's completely backwards as what most of our federal government does, uh, and, and as many candidates are completely backwards to promote any funding or, or military assistance to Israel at, at this point. One minute. And at most points. We have to stop foreign aid completely. I understand that you can't just cut it off because everybody's become dependent upon it. It's like seniors, you can't just stop Medicare, you can't just stop, you have to have a transitional period, which is what the Liberty Platform is stating. But to, when we provide arms, then they provide, then the other side provides arms, and all we're doing is escalating everything. Like in Syria, we give them a billion dollars, then the Soviets are gonna come in and give the other side a billion dollars. It's absolutely, Anthony's right, it's, it's backwards, it's completely backwards. We have to stop foreign aid. And although I've been a supporter of Israel as the only democratic, uh, democracy-based country in the Middle East, they're going to have to get used to the idea that we're not the babysitters. There's nothing in the Constitution that says we have to be the world's policemen. And that's what we've become. And now we're nation building. It's not acceptable and it's not appropriate. And it's not constitutional. Okay. I was asked by uh, Anthony for a 30-second rebuttal, and you'll get one after that. 30 seconds, Anthony. Well, I would make the case that we should immediately cut off all foreign aid. Uh, this is not something that, that helps American citizens if we do it uh, incrementally, and it's not something that helps our currency if we do it incrementally. We are on the verge of a currency collapse, and I know that because I've been in the belly of the beast of Wall Street. I, I've seen the danger that we're in. I, we all know what the Federal Reserve is doing with regards to inflating the currency with their own money, and we're consistently paying an inflation tax, and we can't afford any more of it. Other nations are going to have to be used to the idea that we're not going to fund them. We're not going to give them foreign aid. I'm not talking specifically about humanitarian aid. I mean, we want to have to, the stronger of us have, should help the weaker of us. But our taxpayer dollars has got to go to us. We are having, an infra our infrastructure is collapsing. John, I was on a phone call with John Kerry trying to convince me to, to fund the, the infrastructure bank, which is another Federal Reserve. And I asked him, isn't that sounds like the Federal Reserve? He says, no, no, it's not, but it is. We, we have to stop it. We have to stop it. I just want to do it in a, in a, okay. in a way that is, uh, is considers that we're not going to create a bigger problem than yeah, we have now. We have just over eight minutes left, so I'm going to give four minutes to each candidate for closing remarks. And then we need to vote. Yeah. And then we vote, yeah, that's why we have to do this. So. We have to down for the managers are so bad. Okay, then. Uh, 421, let's go. Two okay. minutes. Two minutes, two minutes each. Two closing minutes. remarks. Two minutes. Two minutes. Well, uh, if anybody would like to see the debate uh, in 2010 uh, that I was in, it's, it's on uh, tolda2012.com in the video section. Uh, I would make the case again that I've taken the fight to Steve Israel harder than anybody in that debate. I've built a strong foundation. I've made internet news fighting for the cause of liberty very much in between the two campaigns. Uh, one of those times being when I discovered a UN flag displayed in, in my hometown, Farmingdale Village Court, larger and, and taller than the American flag. And uh, I got exposure to that nationwide, worldwide, even through Infowars.com. And I, I am somebody that has been a, a strong voice against these dangers of the international uh, of enemies of the Constitution and the domestic enemies of the Constitution, uh, which are both equally dangerous. And I will continue to be a voice that's been unwavering in, in, uh, in my 
support of our sovereignty. I've been unwavering in my uh, viable 10-point plan to fix our economy. I've been unwavering in our civil liberties. Uh, this is not some spur of the moment uh, inspiration of mine. It's, it's something that I'm devoting my life to. Okay. Two minutes, Mr. McDermott. Okay. Um, I guess here's the rub. We have this is a very critical election. I mean, I know every election they all say that. I'm really the only person here that knows what I had to do. I want to follow the libertarian platform and restore our liberties. I just I decided not to run as a Republican. I decided to not explore the Constitution Party. I mean, I did explore it, but I decided not to not to talk to them about it. In, in seriousness, even though Chris O'Hare, you can check it. I would like you to look at Anthony Holder's camp uh, debate with Steve Israel and John Gomez and make your mind up if he won. But if we want to get more than 1,258 votes, we have to all pull together, Queens, Nassau, and Suffolk, with the Gary Johnson campaign, because they're the ones that are here organizing, and let's pull together, let's get signatures, let's have 10,000 signatures from the 3rd District and the 10th, 2nd District. I, I mean, that's what we can do. And I really am very committed to this. I'm going to deliver those signatures, I'm going to get on the ballot, I want to be on the ballot as a Libertarian. And I hope that you guys will endorse me, because a Libertarian platform is where we should be. I'm not 